Okay, so today we are basically going to learn about antimicrobial resistance. Uh, we are going to look at the mechanisms of resistance, what causes resistance, and how we can prevent resistance. At the end of the day, we shall look at some case studies on patients who have been treated, but later their bug developed resistance. And what can you do about such groups of patients? So um, this is a disclaimer. These are not slides that I made. They were shared to me by Dr. Linus Ndoko. Um, he works at the CDC and he's also been very instrumental in training students at the University of Nairobi on antimicrobial resistance. We work a lot with him, especially for the medical final year students in the first couple of years. So these are just some of the slides that we used to present. So these are not slides that I made, but that's a disclaimer I made. All the credit goes to the Linus Lake. Okay, so now to the content. Um, Janice, I don't know how long I have. How much time do I have? Um, you have one hour. Okay, the presentation. That can be sufficient for this because I have some. We have, you can actually see we have quite some objectives to achieve by the end of this lecture. So these are the objectives that we aim to achieve by the end of this lecture. So we shall define what antibiotic susceptibility is, what resistance is, and what is meant by a breakpoint. Then we shall look at uh, some lab methods that are used to determine antibiotic susceptibility. We shall then discuss the factors that contribute to antimicrobial resistance, and then discuss some resistance mechanisms and each of the classes of antibiotics that are affected. Finally, using clinical cases, we shall be able to understand the clinical implications of resistance for the common infecting microorganisms, such as staph aureus, streptococcus pneumonia, and gram-negative organisms. So the outline of this lecture will start with an introduction. Then we shall look at the key terms that you need to understand. And then we'll look at susceptibility testing methods and what is done in the lab. We'll then go on to factors contributing to antibiotic resistance, mechanisms of resistance, clinical examples, and then we shall conclude. So I really like this to be an interactive session. So I'll be pausing to ask for opinions. I'll keep people at random based on their tenants so that we can be able to actually discuss and we can be able to contribute your experience because I understand this is a group of medical students, pharmacy students, I think nursing. So it's human and animal health, I understand. So we shall be able to exchange our perspectives on this and actually even bring up how one health is important. As a way of introduction, um, if you've done your pharmacology by now, you can actually, you actually know that the first use of antibiotics was in the 1930s and 1940s. That's when the first antibiotics were introduced from the sulfonamides onto the penicillins. And then when you're trying to eradicate something, it comes up with defense mechanisms. And so once antibiotics were introduced, bacteria also came up with ways of defending themselves against these new molecules. And that's just a way of natural selection. Every living thing tries to defend itself and protect itself from extinction and death. And therefore bacteria quickly adapted to this introduction of antibiotics and developed mechanisms to escape the effects and we shall look at some of these mechanisms. And therefore, between the 1930s and now, 
a lot of antibiotics have been developed. And because of this resistance mechanism, then drug discovery tends to now look at how do we develop antibiotics that microorganisms will not be able to resist. So several classes of antibiotics have been developed. But because bacteria are also becoming clever in the way they protect themselves, you find that once a new molecule is introduced into a market, the bacteria will find ways of trying to resist that. And now the pharmaceutical industry is thinking, we, have, we keep developing antibiotics. After some time, they become useless because of resistance. So in the 1990s then, um, industry started shifting from investing in antibiotics because at the end of the day, after resistance has developed to a drug, then it doesn't become economically viable. So you can actually see new antibiotic development has decreased with increasing antibiotic resistance. And this is putting us all in danger, both human lives and animal lives. What if there is no antibiotic then to help us in treatment of common infections because of antimicrobial resistance? And so we have actually seen how resistance has contributed to a number of deaths and again increase in healthcare expenses because then you have to seek out a more expensive product or multiple products to treat a resistant bug. So just as a way of introduction again, much as a lot of information about resistance is geared towards bacteria, it's important to note that beyond bacteria, we also have other organisms developing resistance. For example, fungi. When you look at Candida species, for example, we have candida resistance, candida. We've all heard about MDR TB. We've also heard about MDR malaria, and thank God the malaria vaccine was just made recently. I'm sure some of you have heard about it. When we look at antivirals, again, there's a lot of um, resistance. And in our setting, we find a lot of resistance on antiretroviral drugs. So you have uh, people being switched from um, first line antiretrovirals to second line because of resistance. So you can add resistance to antiretrovirals uh, to also that one of influenza. So basically, it's not only bacteria that are resistant, but also viruses and fungi can propose so let us look at the key terms that you need to learn when you're addressing antimicrobial resistance. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat or write them down, and then we shall discuss them at the end of this talk. So just for you to know, there's a difference between an antibiotic and an antimicrobial. An antibiotic is a drug that will kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria. Just correct that. An antibiotic targets bacteria. When you talk about an antimicrobial, then you're thinking about multiple microbes. You include other things like uh, mycobacteria, you include viruses. So antimicrobial looks at resistance to many microorganisms many types of microorganisms, but antibiotic resistance looks at bacterial resistance. So what is this resistance that you're talking about? It actually means that you're giving an antibiotic and the bacteria will not be inhibited or it will not be killed by this antibiotic if you're giving it at clinically achievable concentration, it means when you give an antibiotic at the correct dose, it's not able to eliminate an infection. 
what does susceptibility mean? Again, it's another arbitrary designation. It means that an antimicrobial will inhibit bacterial growth when you give the correct dose, the correct clinical dose. Now, let us look at minimal inhibitory concentration. And I know some of you are aware of what it is. Some of you are not aware. So when we look at MIC, it's the minimum inhibitory concentration. And what does it mean? It means that it's the lowest concentration of an antimicrobial that will inhibit growth of bacteria. And MICs are usually uh, determined within the lab, and I will show you how they do that. Some of you have already done microbiology, and I'm sure you've done some of these practical or um, checking for MICs of different plants. Then you also have another term called the MDC. This means it is the minimal bactericidal concentration. And it's the concentration of an antimicrobial that's able to kill bacteria. So MIC basically inhibits the growth of bacteria. MDC is that concentration that kills bacteria. And again, this is used clinically only in special circumstances. MIC is mostly large. A breakpoint is the MIC that is used to designate between susceptible and resistant strains of bacteria. And this is usually um, set by a committee, a committee of infectious disease experts who look at different drugs and the concentrations and the MICs and the lab data, and then they will decide for this drug, this is the drug point. What is the difference um, between susceptible and resistant? So having defined the key terms, let us look at um, the different lab testing methods that are used to get MIC and MDC, basically to uh, show you susceptibility of bacteria and other microorganisms to antimicrobials. So for the minimal, minimum inhibitory concentration, and a lot of you have been able to um, do this in the lab or you have demonstrated this in the lab. So it's basically, as we say, the lowest concentration that is able to inhibit the growth of bacteria. Now, um, sorry about that. So what they usually do, they put different concentrations of, um, first of all, they put bacteria and the bacteria grows with all these tubes. And then they will put different concentrations of uh, antimicrobial, and where they uh, observe no growth will be the MIC. The dose at which there's no growth, uh, growth is inhibited, the solution will start becoming here. That's where um, we turn it as the MIC. And it's usually measured in micrograms per milliliter. So these are just automated methods because right now a lot of things are going through um, automatic processes are being developed that make lab easier. So a lot of labs will use automat automated testing. And these are the plates that are used and these are the automatic machines that are used to make lab easier. Some of you may have come across them, others may have not. Other methods that can be used include the Kirby Bauer disk diffusion, the other dilution, and the ether coating. You can go and familiarize yourself with this in microbiology. So let us briefly look at the concept of breakpoint to determine susceptibility by giving an example of. Uh, antibiotics and the MICs and the breakpoint. Remember what was breakpoint? It's the MIC that is, let me see if someone is following my 
What was break point? Anyone? Charity, I can see you there. Mukwiwa. What was break point? There is. That's an understanding to speak. People are not following what I'm saying. What was break point? You just described it a few minutes ago. Let me put you back. So that you can follow it. You got it now, yeah? So the MIC that is to designate between susceptibility and resistance, okay? That is it. So if we look at this, if the MIC is higher than the breakpoint, then you see resistance. I have um, highlighted a few antibiotics. So if you're doing an MIT and a breakpoint and they are the same, it means there is resistance. So this antibiotic, even if you gave it for treatment of a disease which requires ciprofloxacin, then the patient will not be able to uh, respond. If we look at now uh, the example of neuropenem and the breakpoint is four, that is it, four or eight. If we look at, if we compare with piperacin in tazobactam, the breakpoint is higher, much, much higher than the MIC, okay? Therefore, if this value is higher, it tends to show more susceptibility. But if the breakpoint is lower than the MIC, then you will see resistance, as well as the breakpoint is the same as the MIC. So basically, that's how it goes. So basically, ciprofloxus is a poor choice, even though the MIC is the lowest of the two. So you're looking at these values. So let us look at factors contributing to antimicrobial resistance. Now, the take home message here is antibiotic use leads to antibiotic resistance. As long as you're using antibiotic, bacteria will try and protect themselves. So, in the outpatient setting, what are some of the factors that lead to resistance? Patients who, let's say, um, patients who, let's say, purchase antibiotics in pharmacies. Anybody? I'm failing to complete the red dot. Yeah, failing to complete the dose, isn't it? Uh, any other contribution? Nisha? I, I said I'll be calling people at Brando. Yeah, hello? Yes, Nisha. Yeah, I was saying, I think maybe when they have lack of money, they're not able to buy a, buy a full dose. They buy maybe two capsules of amoxin or four capsules of amoxin. Mm. Yeah, and that actually uh, contributes, that actually contributes to the resistance. Any other in the outpatient setting? Even things like sharing of antibiotics with relatives who can't afford or not finishing a dose. What about the inpatient? If someone is admitted, what factors of use will be will affect 
and contribute to resistance. Let me see if it's equal. Is Swaib there? Swaib is power. Um, and Chennai, in the impression, I, what factor? Yes, go ahead. I, I, okay, I'm going to try. I think um, for the inpatient, uh, whereby a patient is relapsing when you use the same same drug on the patient. Mm. Okay, that's okay. Um, any other factors for someone who is admitted? Sometimes someone is given antibiotics when they really don't have an infection. You see, someone may be having a fever or metiophilia because of something that's not an infection. But because they have those supporting symptoms, those symptoms that indicate infection, they are given an antibiotic even without confusing investigations. Agriculture. Is there anyone from vet school to tell us about how agriculture contributes resistance? Seems there's no one from vet Oh, yes, someone talked about incorrect and beautiful therapy as charity. Thank you. Um, so, in agriculture, a lot of uh, 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 antibiotics well, are used to promote growth of animals. Yeah. And now, if these antibiotics end up in chicken, and you go and eat that chicken, you'll be consuming some doses of that antibiotic through the chicken. And eventually you get resistance. So I think um, studies have actually shown there's a very high contribution of agriculture to antibiotic resistance. And this is something that needs to be considered. They say it's about Agriculture contributes about 70% to antimicrobial resistance. Um, a study was done, I, I'm sorry, this is a very old study that was done in 1998, and they asked patients questions and physicians questions, and this was regarding overuse of antibiotics. So they did eight or five groups and they documented patient concerns and physicians concerns. So the patients said they want a clear explanation of why they're using an antibiotic. Because sometimes they go to a doctor, the doctor doesn't explain everything very well, they just write a prescription, they find themselves with an antibiotic a lot of times not needing the antibiotics. Um, Guidelines say for upper respiratory tract infections, a lot of them will just be viral and not bacterial. So if someone sees themselves with a discharge, a lot of times they'll be thinking, oh, I have an infection. So let me run and get an antibiotic. So if you tell this patient that's most likely just a viral infection, they, they might not believe you for a lot of them because sometimes their discharge may be colored. Some of them actually just want to get better and return to work. So they think antibiotics will do the trick. Physician concerns, if you are a patient and you went to a physician and they never wrote you a prescription of anything, then you start standing this physician as a bad doctor, you go to the next. So some doctors are actually under pressure to prescribe antibiotics from the patients. And this also happens in community pharmacy, where you see people actually going to demand for moxie, people going to demand for flagyl, people demanding for azithromycin and stuff like that. And if you are a professional and you don't sell those antibiotics, what happens? They'll go to the next pharmacy with an unprofessional, someone who is just geared to sell drugs on, they will get it. Sometimes patients are concerned about the diagnostic uncertainty, especially 
then they realize it's empiric treatment, you've not done all the tests, uh, but you're giving them antibiotics. Some of them want to leave the facility as fast as they can there. And uh, uh, I mean, rather, uh, physicians, the whole thing of empiric therapy and diagnostic uncertainty also will force them into giving an antibiotic without all the necessary, um, without all the necessary investigations done. When you look at time pressure, I think it affects both patients and physicians. Physicians will have a long line of patients that they want to get rid of. And they have limited time and they have to see multiple patients. So give a prescription, move on with life. And patients sometimes are encouraged to go back in the store. So those are some of the things that will affect and contribute to antibiotic overuse. And again, um, you need to know what a colonization is. So a colonization is where, when you're taking a lab, a sample from a patient to go to the lab, instead of taking a sample that is for an infective organism, you tend to uh, maybe get normal flora and you grow it, okay? Or sometimes someone who is taking a sample from a patient can contaminate it with their own normal flora. Um, if you look at the patient that is highlighted here, this is a patient who is heavily instrumented. There are lots of catheters and drains from this patient, this is most likely a critical care patient. And again, they have a lot of invasive devices and this places them at risk of colonization. These are patients who are likely to be on multiple, multiple antibiotics uh, because even catheters themselves are at risk for colonization by bacteria. So resistance can then be transmitted between patients as well. For example, if this patient were to die or they're transferred to another bed and another patient is um, admitted to that same bed without thorough sterilization, the same equipment I used on that patient, it's possible that uh, this patient will be able to transfer those resistance strains to the new patient who comes to the same bed. Patients that are at high risk of colonization include those who are immunocompromised, those who are generally hospitalized, and those with um, a lot of invasive devices like this patient we can see here. So now that we looked at factors contributing to resistance, let us go now to mechanisms of resistance, and I'll expect you guys to remember your pharmacology. So this is a slide that shows, the different colors are just showing resistance to different drugs, okay? So you can have a microbe that's showing resistance to several drugs. You can see one bacteria here is uh, resistance to three. One is not resistant at all, then you can see one resistant to one drug, and this one is resistant to two. So this bacteria will meet, and they will replicate, and they will start being multi-resistant. So as replication continues, and we give another drug, we tend to develop now multi-drug resistance bacteria. So with different drugs being used and replication of bacteria, they tend to replicate to form um, bacteria that are resistant to um, multiple drugs depending on exposure. And that's how you end up with uh, multi-drug resistant bacteria. And they increase, they tend to increase in number. So basically, bacteria resistant to a particular drug are selected and they replicate. And if you expose them to different uh, uh, to expose them to different antibiotics, then it's possible that they can develop MDR. 
as we have shown in this picture. Now, let us remind ourselves of the pharmacology of anti-infective agents. And that will be very important because once we know that, then we shall see the mechanisms through which bacteria inhibit these drugs by focusing on their mode of action. So we know that there are antibiotics that inhibit cell wall synthesis, and this is the cell wall. So this is a whole list of drugs, different classes of antibiotics, penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems, vancomycin, cyclosylin. There are those that tend to target DNA replication of the bacteria, like nalidixic acid and chloroquinolones, and also uh, the DNA-dependent RNA polymerases like rifampicin, they tend to affect this DNA replication. There are uh, antibiotics that um, then inhibit protein synthesis within the bacterial uh, cell. And these are the examples. There are those who, which also, there are 50 years inhibitors and 30 years inhibitors and penetrates 15, 30 here. So erythromycin, chloramphenicol, etc. tend to affect the 50 S and tetracycline, spectinomycin, streptomycin, the polymyxins and daptomycin affect the cell membrane integrity. And then folic acid metabolism is affected by drugs like permethrin and sulfonamide. So these are the different modes of actions of antibiotics. Now let us look at how bacteria opposes those modes of action. So bacteria can resist antibiotics through several mechanisms. One type of bacteria may uh, exhibit resistance through many mechanisms. And that's why you have multi-drug resistant bacteria. So if you introduce an antibiotic, some bacteria may develop efflux pumps. So they have these pumps. Once the antibiotic enters, it's immediately pumped out of the bacterial cell. Here, you find the plasmids. They will generate, they will lead to development of either enzymes that degrade bacteria, I mean, enzymes that degrade the incoming antibiotic. So um, an antibiotic comes into the cell, but enzymes quickly degrade it. Or you can have from the plasmid, you have generation of enzymes that alter the antibiotic and make it useless. And we also have antibiotic resistance that for this. Then we have target sites of antibiotics that can be altered. Some bacteria will also decrease permeability of the cell membrane and the cell wall to the antibiotic. So they'll pump antibiotics out. They will cause enzymes to degrade them or alter their structure so that they are useless. Some will alter the active site of the antibiotic rendering process. So um, the antibiotic degrading enzymes can do that by sulfonation of the antibiotic, phosphorylating it or, esteri or esterifying the antibiotic, especially from glyphosate, like gentleman. Beta lactamases are enzymes that will tend to break down beta lacta antibiotics. So we have simple extended spectrum beta lactamases, cephalosporinases, and carbapenemases. So all these enzymes we tend to just break down the drugs. Uh, they may be encoded on the chromosome of the plasmid, and these beta lactamases that are produced by gram negative are reported. Um, examples of antibiotics, uh, or rather, microbes that produce beta lactamases include 
H influenza and gonorrhea start for years. So we have extended spectrum beta lactamases, and these ones are capable of hydrolyzing extended spectrum cephalosporins. So this extended uh, spectrum drugs and, uh, are not spare. A lot of them are associated with E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia, but other bacteria can also be involved. Again, this is plasmid mediated, and the drugs that are affected include aminoglycosides, ciprofloxacin, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and these are usually encoded in the same plasmid. This has become very significant um, resistance in clinical settings. Class A, carbapenemesis, are found in Klebsiella pneumonia, and also E. coli and other drug negatives, including the very toxic ones like Pseudomonas and Proteus species. And again, usually have MDR mechanisms, very similar to the extended spectrum, beta lactamases, but are also carbapenemic resistance. And there was a problem with this in New York City. And these ones can spread across species, other gram negatives, so they are not limited to this alone. And if you look at patients in long-term care facilities, they are more likely to be affected. Um, when you look at this decreased permeability of the cell wall to antibiotics, pseudomonas is a culprit there, and it affects many antibiotics, including carbapenems. Which bacteria are notorious for pumping out antibiotics as they come in? Pseudomonas can pump out a lot of antibiotics. And this includes tetracyclines and macrolides. Um, which kind of uh, bacteria alter the target site for antibiotics? We find the DNA gyrus enzymes produced by many gram negative bacteria and strep pneumonia, they target chlorophenols, the active site of chlorophenols. Then you have penicillin binding proteins, and this is the mechanism of action for MRSC and penicillin resistance to pneumonia. For the gram negative cell wall, gram positive cell wall, um, this uh, the, the target is affecting drugs like vancomycin and the notorious antibiotics here, the antibiotic species. Um, what's targeting ribosomes? Uh, tetracyclines and macrolides and the um, drugs that are affected here are tetracycline macro, macrolides and the infected organisms that are responsible for this as strep. Pneumonia, staph aureus, and gonorrhea, and other enteric gram negative rules. So, do we have any questions up to that point before I go to clinical examples? Anybody with a question? Let me see what's in the chat. Oh, Miriam Kasamu said most farmers, we were talking about veterinary and she said most farmers get most of their drugs from agrovet without involving veterinarians very very true a lot of people who sell agrovet medication are just people who are not professionals and therefore and that's the same thing that really is reflected with human uh, medication you find that a lot of people in pharmacies don't even understand what they're doing there and Daniel agrees with that comment. So, any comment or any question before we proceed? Can I proceed then with the clinical examples? I think I should. So, we shall look at clinical examples involving resistance with staph aureus, strep pneumonia, and E. coli. And then we shall come to a conclusion. So 
Let us look at the first patient case, and I would like this to be a discussion. So we have a 50-year-old female patient. She has type 2 diabetes mellitus. Now, patients with type 2 diabetes are more likely to also be immunocompromised because diabetes uh, interferes with the immune cell function. Number two, these patients are more likely to develop um, what is called um, neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy. And because of that nerve damage and interaction with blood supply, a lot of these patients tend to be affected. And this is the case for this 50-year-old female who was admitted for an elective total knee replacement. Now, after surgery on day four, they started to develop fever, very high fever at nine degrees, and they also developed a great purulent wound discharge. Purulent wound discharge means the, the uh, wound is discharging fast. So they did a gram stain of the exudate. And on examination, it showed neutrophils. Neutrophils are white blood cells that come in very fast when you have, the levels increase very fast when you have a bacterial infection because there are line of defense. Uh, it also showed gram-positive profile, which means it's a gram-positive infection. And because of that, the patient was started on cefazoli, which is intravenous. After two days, she still remained febrile, which means the drug might not have been working. And the wound also showed little improvement. So you're seeing after two days on an IV antibiotic, and this is a first generation cephalosporin. This patient still has symptoms and they're not resolving. That's the gram stain. You can see a lot of neutrophils and you can also see uh, the bacteria. So after the, after the gram stain, they cultured samples from the wound and they grew. Staphylococcus aureus, which was resistant to penicillin, methicillin, all cephalosporins, erythromycin, tetracycline, gentamicin, and cyclophloxacin. So, really, what do you have to treat this patient with? Because a lot of the drug classes that treat a simple staph infection, you see a lot of resistance in this patient. So, what did they decide to do? They debrided the wound. The, the debridement means if there's any damage and rotting flesh, it is removed. So for such surgical patient, if there's any rotting flesh, remove that flesh because uh, you want antibiotics to penetrate the wound well and treat the patient. This patient was then started on vancomycin and they improved. So you can actually see how many drugs for this patient infection resistance to a lot. After four days of vancomycin, she seemed to respond. She was discharged and given oral trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole for two weeks. Now, the interesting thing, three months later, there was a recurrence in infection. Yeah? And she was having a deep prosthetic joint infection. Now, Patients who undergo orthopedic surgeries, if you don't treat the infection well, especially if they're having a prosthesis, this patient had an elective total knee replacement, which means they're being given a prosthesis to replace their knee. This prosthesis by itself is also um, it's possible to become culture medium for bacteria. So even after the initial uh, improvement, they still have a prosthesis, okay? And the prosthesis gets infected. For these patients who undergo bone joint surgeries, orthopedic surgeries, an infection, what you need to know, an infection can even appear one year later. And that can cause the 
because tense is not to come from very well. So this is something that you always need to know. This one presented three months later with a recurrence of symptoms, which means the prosthesis is infected. Usually you have to remove that prosthesis. And they develop methicillin resistant staph bolus. So um, MRSA prevalence is increasing in the USA compared to other drug resistance. So you can actually see in the USA lots of rates, a high rates of MRSA. Luckily in our settings, we don't see very high rates of MRSA. Well, that happens in that patient. For surgical site infections, um, you can also see a very high rate of MRSA. And what this p value means is just statistically significant. It means that a lot of patients um, who have uh, MRSA are more likely to die within 90 days. And they are more likely to stay very long in after surgery. They're more likely to stay for very long days. This one stay 23 days in hospital on average of 12 to 13. After surgery and after the infection, they're more likely to stay 15 days. So it shows that surgical site infections with MRSA um, have a heavy impact. Death and at least the patients are more likely to die and we can actually see prolongation of the duration of stay in hospital after surgery and even after infection. Um, there's also glycopeptide resistance staph aureus. So this one was first reported in Japan with vancomycin showing an MIC of eight micrograms per ml. Still very uncommon, but we are more likely to get it if we overuse vancomycin because of persistent staph aureus infections. Staph aureus infections are very common. Um, glycopeptide high level resistance was first reported in Michigan with a very high MIC in a patient with diabetes and chronic renal failure. Uh, this patient had peripheral vascular disease and they were resistant to um, uh, resistance came from vancomycin resistance and teratopa. This is again very uncommon, but it's something that you need to watch out for. Uh, so you're seeing drugs like vancomycin. Uh, the reason why I'm highlighting vancomycin is because when you have patients with MRSA and they're not responding to drugs like penicillin and cephalosporins, you then give vancomycin. But again, you're seeing strains of vancomycin resistance. So we need to really use that drug very well. So case number two. Case number two is a 67 year old man with cancer, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And he was admitted with a sudden onset of a high fever, rigors, pleuritic, pleuritic chest pain, and productive goal. So once they examined this patient and the chest x-ray got confirmed an infection of uh, pneumonia and he was started on azithromycin, one of the first drugs of choice for pneumonia. Uh, this is the gram stain that was obtained and it shows numerous neutrophils. So you can see neutrophils coming to fight and you can actually see those. And after 48 hours, no improvement. Clinically, the patient is getting worse and we still have high fevers. So a blood culture was done and we showed strep pneumonia resistant to penicillin, cefriaxone, and nitromycin, and clindamycin. And these are drugs that are the first drugs of choice for management of pneumonia. This is just data that's showing um, an increase in drugs that are resistant to, increase in resistant rates of different antibiotics. We have gotten worse by now because this is data from 2001. Um, 
We also have an increasing resistance rate of macrolides, and this is data from the USA. Ours could be much higher percentages. So this was done over a six year period, and you see strep pneumonia being very resistant to macrolides. Antibiotics here, macrolides are used to manage that. And again, we see um, chloroquinolone resistance in Canada. Again, strep pneumonia, we can actually see an increase in health. And um, the increase is higher in older patients compared to those who are much younger. Here shows people who are older than 64 years. This is data from Canada. Let us look at our case number three. This is a 45 year old female who presents with symptoms of a urinary tract infection. So they present with urinary agency, urinary frequency, and dysuria. Dysuria means when you urinate, it's burning. They did a urinalysis and it showed positive for leukocyte esterase and it shows also white blood cells within the urine. They gram stained and it showed uh, white blood cells and many gram negative words. And the most common cause of UTIs within the community was the color. So once they cultured the urine, uh, it grew E. coli. And that E. coli was resistant to ciprofloxacin. Again, ciprofloxacin is one of the first drugs of choice to give for managing a urinary tract infection. This drug was also resistant to trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, but was sensitive to septuagenin. So when you look at community data on community acquired resistance E. coli, uh, this is mostly for UTIs. UTIs are very, very common. And again, they are common in young, healthy women. And again, young, healthy women because sexual activity is a predisposing factor for UTI. From doing sexual activity, some of the equal life can be put from the GI system into the vagina. So it's a very, it's a fairly common condition in young females, but it can affect the elderly who have um, other comorbidities. Now, um, chloroquinolones have been the first drugs of choice for treating E. coli acquired in the community, but you're seeing increasing resistance as well as resistance to trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. And mostly because of um, cotrimoxazole beta lactamase that become more common, and they're also causing cephalosporin resistance. So, these are some of the mechanisms by which E. coli is actually causing um, resistance to these drugs. So in conclusion, we have inappropriate and excessive use of antibiotics contributing majorly to emerging antibiotic resistance. Uh, determinants of resistance are selected for by antibiotics. So we actually saw what determines overuse of antibiotics among patients, what makes doctors prescribe antibiotics more. And what you also need to take home is that bacteria have multiple mechanisms for resistance. And this is what is causing the major problem in antibiotic use. And this resistance has become now a global problem uh, in, in outpatient and inpatient settings and uh, affects a wide variety of infections. It's a global problem and a serious threat to public health because if we lose the only remaining antibiotic, and as we said earlier, a lot of industries are not investing in antibiotics because of this problem of uh, resistance. What are we going to do to manage our infections? And therefore, that's where you come in. We have to be advocates of judicious use of a not judicious, responsible use of antibiotics within the community, within hospital settings, within pharmacies, and also within veterinary settings. So I will stop there. That's the end of my presentation.
and I will take any questions. Thank you very much. Over to you, Janice. Thank you, Dr. Sylvia, for that uh, wonderful presentation. I'm sure we've all learned a few things. So there's one question in the chat um, from Murungi Waib. So he's asking if we have any research data regarding our African setting. I think this was in reference to the MRC resistance. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. Could you please, um, Morungi, maybe can clarify, was he talking about veterinary MRC or what? Because it was, the question is not very clear. Maybe you can clarify. Murungi, um, you can feel free and uh, type in the chat box. Okay, something is in the chat. Oh, he's talking about MRSA. Yes, we have done a lot of microbiology studies um, in our local hospitals, and we actually see low instances of methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, but that doesn't mean that not use our antibiotics deliciously. The rates of MRSA in Kenya, at least for the studies that we have done, and these studies have been published. So you can just look at some of the studies that have been published. I published one for the surgical setting and the MRSAs are low. That has been the same in pediatrics and critical care within Kenya. So MRSA is low, but it's still an area of concern. Uh, uh, one question from Kenneth Karanja. How well are the antimicrobial stewardship programs in Kenya? I assume he's talking about the effectiveness of antimicrobial resistance. Um, within hospitals, we, we have, and we means uh, I'm part of the National Antimicrobial Stewardship Team in Kenya. So, what we have done is number one, come up with antimicrobial stewardship guidelines. This we released um, in 2019. So they have been in circulation. Subsequently, we have been training healthcare workers on how to implement those antimicrobial stewardship guidelines. We've trained healthcare workers from several, I think several counties we brought them here in Nairobi. We trained them on how to utilize the antimicrobial stewardship guidelines. And we have used their own data in their own hospitals, data on antimicrobial use to actually show them areas where they can go. Um, we had a grant called the Fleming Grant, which has been doing all this. We go to those hospitals or we invite them and we train them on the guidelines and we have also been following up on the antibiotic use data to actually show are they using antibiotics well. So, so far we've obtained data from several hospitals and we have seen pediatrics and surgery and a bit of medicine, medical wards where and, and critical care where antibiotics are not being used well. So we use that data from uh, local hospitals to actually help them to improve um, on their antimicrobial stewardship. The other thing is that we combine antimicrobial stewardship with infection prevention and control because you can actually use, you can implement antimicrobial stewardship program, but people have no water pressure or people use the same gloves from one infected patient to another. So infection prevention and control has also been incorporated in that. And let's see how effective that is because you can have guidelines train people, but you also have to look at the attitudes and the knowledge and practice so that this can also help to reinforce the use of those guidelines. So it's something that we are working on. And as we have observed, the hospitals pre and post training have seen some improvement in microbial use. Uh, we have another question. From uh, one minute. Nishat Umra, they're asking should antibiotics be sold as a prescription only medication and not over the counter? And uh, what impact 
will that have on the poor? Well, antibiotics are prescription only medicine, full stop. You cannot share them out as um, OTCs. Reason, we have already seen the high rates of resistance that can develop with antibiotics. And this judicious use of antibiotics, where you also see carelessness where people purchase antibiotics of the counter, they swallow one, one capsule and retain the rest, which means they've not completely cleared that bacteria. If you're looking at social economics, someone who has developed antimicrobial resistance and are poor are more, are more likely not to, uh, to be able to afford treatment within the hospital setting because then the treatment options will be much more expensive than simple amoxicillin. So if you're looking at it in the overall, you're actually seeing that it's cheaper for someone to go to hospital and get a cheap antibiotic sold to them for an antibiotic regimen sold at 50 bomb and subsidized in government hospitals than to buy antibiotics over the counter for 100 bomb, develop resistance, and then they're admitted as a critical patient if they no uh, antibiotics to serve them. So if you're looking at it from someone just avoiding antibiotics over the counter, you need to look at it as the bigger picture. What is the impact? If there's resistance, they will have to be hospitalized and they will have to spend a lot more than they would have spent if the infection is treated uh, with a prescription for an infection that has been correctly diagnosed. Um, another question from Miriam. Do you think One Health approach is one of the approaches to help deal with AMR issue? Yes, yes, One Health is very important. Um, so One Health basically means people in human medicine are working with veterinary and environmental, because we also know environmental health is very important, especially when you think about um, industries that produce antibiotics, the effluent is sent into the environment and all those things. So if we work as human medicine, veterinary medicine and environmental, then we are actually able to uh, counter this antimicrobial resistance. Interestingly, on Monday, we are going to meet as a One Health team. We have people from vet, human medicine and environmental and we are going to discuss an integrated guideline on how we should work together to combat antimicrobial resistance. So that's something that I can possibly share much later, but we'll be working on such a um, Okay, thank you for that. So I also have a question on the, the total knee replacement surgery, that uh, case that we're talking about. You said the, um, there's a likelihood of relapsing, like the resistant microbe coming up again, like after one year, like that. So uh, how does this happen? So what happens when a patient is operated on and they are to be given a prosthesis, one thing with your clinical acumen, you need to know that I'm introducing a foreign body into this person's body, isn't it? Now, yeah. this foreign body, is inside the bone. And within the bone, the antibiotics which cannot even penetrate bone. Bone infections are also, if they are chronic, they're usually very insidious. They develop very slowly over time. Okay? Now, those mm -hmm. are the factors that usually contribute to an infection showing up much later. Maybe the uh, prosthesis has refused to work, it's become dysfunctional. Or, the, or there's a, a lot of bone erosion and degradation. This will not happen immediately. And that's why when you're having such patients, it's very important. If you're carrying out the surgery for the first time, you need to give appropriate antimicrobial prophylaxis. If you're uh, giving that prosthesis and the patient is already infected, then you need to give full courses of antibiotics to clear that infection. 
but you should always have it in mind that you put a foreign body in someone's body and that foreign body is likely to be culture um culture media for bacteria and that's why once you operate these patients uh routine clinical examination they should be coming to clinics routinely so that you can have some x-rays done at least to show that there's no infection so usually that's how these patients are followed up again our case was diabetic and if you're having a diabetic patient you have to keep it in mind that this patient is immunocompromised and unlike a patient without diabetes they're more likely to develop infection uh, because of peripheral artery disease um, here the blood supply is very limited and therefore if blood supply is limited then supply of uh, neutrophils and other white blood cells combat the infection is also limited so we think clinically and for such patients close monitoring is very important thank you for that uh, another question from abuga once a bacteria has been implicated to be resistant to a certain antibiotic, do you use a trial and error approach to you determine the effective drug or are there stipulated approaches? So usually in the lab, what they do, they take a sample from the patient and then they will test several because they know this antibiotic can treat a bone infection. And there are several antibiotics, let's say, which can treat a bone infection. So therefore, they will run susceptibility testing for several antibiotics. And for that list of antibiotics, they can pick out which one is susceptible and which one is showing resistance. Then they will be able to recommend the antibiotic which is showing susceptibility to be used to treat. So there's no trial like that. Um, thank you. Thank you. And okay, uh, I have another question. I made an observation for uh, cancer patients when they've been given medication, most of them are put on antibiotics, even if uh, they don't show any biotic, whatever, any ailment. So I was just wondering, okay, of course, this is a misuse of antibiotics, but again, they're very immunocompromised. So is there any other way that um, they can be helped or they just have to be put on antibiotics? Now, there's what is called empiric antibiotic treatment. So, empiric antibiotic treatment is where you give an antibiotic in a patient where the clinical, the clinical uh, manifestations point out to a disease. For example, let's take an example of meningitis. Meningitis pro, that is caused by Neisseria from particular patients, yeah? So when someone comes in, they have very severe headaches, they have stiff neck, they have all this. You don't wait until you've taken your sample, mm. test for CSF before you treat, yeah? This is someone who is having meningitis that can kill within 24 hours. Now for such kind of patients, you strongly rely on your clinical acumen to give antibiotics. Now, the unfortunate thing is that in clinical practice, people tend to just give antibiotics to cover for just in case. You see, someone can be having fever, and maybe that fever is even a drug-induced fever. That fever because of, is because of another inflammatory process, but someone will just give an antibiotic. You see? So it mm. really requires people to have their clinical information and to give empiric therapy to life-threatening illnesses. The other thing that is also very important, as you're mm. giving empiric therapy, you must take the sample before you give the patient an antibiotic. Mm. Because if someone is having meningitis and you've given cephalosporin, yeah, and then after yeah. that you're taking their CSF, most likely that bacteria will be there. And then you come back from the lab with a sterile sample and say, hey, this patient doesn't have an infection. Yes, yeah, they have an infection that the antibiotic had already started clearing. So it's very important. When are you taking the sample? How are you taking the sample? Is that the correct sample? And you give the antibiotic empirically 
as you await results. Once the results have come for this life threatening condition, then you can switch to the susceptible drug. But empiric therapy has been misused, and that's a point of education for clinicians. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Kenneth Karanja Do Kenyan hospitals follow WHO aware guidelines of antibiotics so as to ensure some antibiotics are withheld in treatment till there is no other option available? So last year, not last year, I think that was 2018-2019, must have been 2019, we actually met and uh, came up with the aware categorization of antibiotics for Kenyan hospitals. So we have uh, the reserve antibiotics, we have the watch antibiotics, and we have the accessible antibiotics. And this has been included in the antimicrobial stewardship guideline, but there's also uh, a separate document on aware classification of antibiotics. I was heavily involved in that exercise. So for Kenya, yes, we have the aware classification. What is missing is maybe, are we training clinicians to prescribe according to that and shelve some antibiotics which need to be reserved antibiotics. So I think a lot of training of clinicians and pharmacists and nurses to be able to adopt this is what is missing, but the guidelines are available. Um, thank you. So um, another question also, uh... Since we have online pharmacies like uh, Maidawa, like, are there guidelines in place to ensure that um, they're not able to sell antibiotics without uh, prescription? Now, that's a huge problem. And to me, it's an area of concern because even the PPP is at pains on how to regulate this online pharmacy. What the PPP has told them, well, you can have an online pharmacy and then sell OTCs only. But are they doing that? The implementation of that is not true. I was actually in a pharmacy once and I had I overheard a call coming from somewhere and someone was actually ordering opioids on the phone. So what's happening to antibiotics? So I think this is an area where the pharmacy and poisons board really need to come up with strategies to come up with strategies to uh, regulate these online pharmacies, otherwise we shall beat the game, the very few games that we have made in antimicrobial resistance. Again, even the pharmacies on the ground are not very well regulated because there's a lot of over-the-counter patches of antibiotics, something that again the pharmacy and poisons board is not very well regulated. So both online and pharmacies that are physical need to be heavily regulated. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, Miriam is also asking if uh, there are any MR projects going with someone who is interested. Yep. Come again, you're, you're breaking Janice, just come again. Oh, sorry. Miriam is asking if there are any um, AMR projects ongoing with someone interested can participate in. So from my student perspective, yes, there are many, many MR projects. And uh, yeah, you can participate in the several. There are some, um, well, you, you can come up with projects and then you, you share them. Uh, you participate in international competitions, some like this where you bridge knowledge gaps and stuff like that. And yeah, I'll, I'll share some with you. So that's from my student perspective. Then uh, Dr. Sylvia can answer maybe from perspective if there are any other projects which um, students can participate in? Yes, there are very many projects going on in Kenya uh, about antimicrobials. Um, the first project is actually by uh, Ducit Blue Foundation. It's international, uh, domiciled in Nigeria, and they're doing a knowledge, attitude, and practice survey for African uh, students using a one health approach on what they know about antibiotic use over the counter patches, antimicrobial resistance, etc, etc. So the survey is ongoing and that's one area that you can start. This study was actually conceived after we did a study at the University of Nairobi looking at um, the knowledge and attitudes of 
uh, students in their clinical years regarding MR and we got very interesting findings. So this study, this multi-country study targeting countries in Africa is actually a model of what I did with a few of my students. So um, you can start by joining that survey. Uh, there, there are many, many other studies that are going on. Uh, if you're interested, I can share them. Yeah, please do share them. So um, we have a, a request from one of us. They're asking if you could um, share the slide. Is that okay with you? Well, uh, as I said, my disclaimer was these are not my slides. They were heavily borrowed from someone else. So I have to seek permission to be able to share the slides with you. I have to get permission from him. If he allows me to share them, I'll share. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll once communicate, I'll communicate back to the person. And then uh, a final question from Nishat. Are there any projects involving the awareness to the general public? Projects? Involving awareness to the general pub public. Yes, uh, a lot of studies have been done and they've been published. Our colleagues from um, Washington, Washington State University have been doing population studies on antimicrobial resistance. And some of them are ongoing. Um, actually, Linus Ndegwa is part of that group for CDC Washington State University. So um, I can ask him about what's ongoing with that. Uh, population surveys and I can share the information. Thank you, thank you. So I, I don't think we have any other question. Um, thank you, Dr. Sylvia, for that wonderful presentation, for that um, insight session. So also um, just to remind you guys, we'll be having the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week from 18th to 24th of November. There'll be many activities, so you can plug in. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, we've come to the end of the session. Thank you very much, Dr. Sylvia. Thank you for having me and have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You can leave at your own wheel. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you, Murugi.